It's a warm day in October. Something is off. But it's not the weather, for the sun is always out in the land of the upright. You lean forward in your seat and look around your table. The most powerful men in your country stare back at you and wait, with bated breaths, for your words, for you to lead them. Mes amis et frères, my friends and brothers, you begin. Like thunder with malice, Kalashnikovs and drifting pickup trucks answer your call. Come out! Come out now! More Kalashnikov fire. More pickups screeching. You look around the room. Your friends and brothers are huddled on the floor. The bravest peer through their fingers at you once more. They look for you to lead them. Your pistol firmly in your sweating palm, you know you can't take on the army outside. You also know what they've come for. Come out! The call is bellowed out again. Stay, stay! You shout at the men in the room with you who are starting to obey the orders from outside. It's me they want. You sigh loudly as you walk to the door. Some say you walked. Others say you strolled out. Everyone agrees you held your head high. He had barely stepped out of the door before he was shot, says the day's only survivor. They had come to kill. This is the story of Africa's Che Guevara, Thomas Isidore Sankara. Born in the city of Yako, in a country then known as Upper Volta, Thomas Sankara's family life was one of relative privilege. His father was a gendarme, a military force formed from the native people of Upper Volta used to keep other natives under the control of their French colonial masters. Sankara from an early age probably hated this fact. A young Sankara was constantly getting into fights with the sons of white civil servants and colonial officers in the city of Gao, where he grew up. Ernst Harsh, writing a biography of his life, says that when he was 11, just a few days before Upper Volta was officially independent from France, Thomas was part of a group of boys who took down the French flag in town and raised the new flag of the Upper Volta in its place. When his father was ordered by an angry headmaster to discipline Thomas, he declined. This was unusual. Sankara the Elder was often thrashing his son for such acts of ill discipline and defiance. But even Thomas's father had had enough of the old masters. Restless from an early age, Thomas Sankara was always clashing with his parents. They wanted him to be a Catholic priest. He had eyes for action. So it was that in 1966, at the tender age of 17, Sankara said a definite no to the sheltered life offered by the priesthood and chose instead to join the army. But Sankara had only half the heart of a soldier. You see, the perfect soldier carries out orders and doesn't question them. Some might say the perfect soldier is a man without a soul. Sankara was not this. His soul possessed him and only one half of that soul was a soldier's. The other was that of a thinker. Sankara never stopped thinking. He never ceased to question, and the question of what was right and what was wrong followed his restless mind wherever he went. Like when he was stationed in Madagascar, training to be an officer at the age of 20. There, Sankara saw how a people dissatisfied with neo-colonialism could rise up successfully and take the reins of power. Just like in Upper Volta, the government of Madagascar had recently gained independence from the French. But, off the record, it was still tied to France's wishes and desires. Madagascar had a puppet government. And so the Malagasy people rose up. Philibert Siranana's government fell. Watching on, Sankara was doing what the perfect soldier was not supposed to do. He was thinking for himself. Reading Karl Marx and a wide array of political philosophers, he took an interest in agriculture and the hard-working nature of the common African. 
Sankara's conclusion seemed to be that there was nothing common about the African. In 1974, he fought in a border war between his country and Mali and became an overnight celebrity for his performance in the war. But again, Sankara was thinking. We know this because years later he would denounce this war as, quote, useless and unjust. Now, not many soldiers look back on the wars that made them national heroes and condemn them as pointless. Shams and rackets meant to make rich men richer and powerful men more powerful. Thomas Sankara was one of the few. After the war, Sankara carried on in the military, rising through the ranks rapidly. He was made commander of a commando training center in the city of Po, near the border with Ghana. And in 1981, under the presidency of Sae Zerbo, he became a minister of information. Sankara had only turned 31 and he was already a cabinet minister. Doing 100 miles an hour and still accelerating, Sankara's life was going to need another lane. The fast lane was clearly too slow. And yet, while others rode into work in their Mercedes convoys, he bicycled into work. Sankara walked with kings and never lost the common touch. He was a major government minister, yet in his spare time, he played in a jazz band called Tuta Coupe Jazz and rode his bicycle everywhere. On a continent where the size of your private jet is the mark of your rank, Sankara the army captain, Sankara the cabinet minister, preferred a bicycle. This was in stark contrast to his closest friend, a man he had sworn an oath of secrecy with in 1976 as part of a secretive group of young officers called the Communist Officers Group. This man was Blaise Compaori, who loved wealth and opulence and felt that official power should come with its rewards. Surely friendship with Sankara would have been like mixing water with oil. Not so. Sankara had the knack for walking with crowds while maintaining his virtue. This virtue was demonstrated with fearlessness when he resigned in 1982 from the government of Sae Zerbo. Why? Sankara believed in freedom of the press, even when it hurt the government. Sae Zerbo did not. Maliu Asyoke Balyone Pepel was Sankara's parting shot to the president misfortune to those who gag the people. These were not idle words from a part-time musician who fancied himself a poet. This was a curse. Sae Zerbo was ousted by Major Dr. John Baptiste Uwe de Raugo in 1982, and Sankara was appointed Prime Minister shortly after, an acceptance by the new regime of how popular a political figure Sankara had become. The question now was, with a second crack at power, would Sankara be a little more compromising? Let us say, diplomatic. <laughs> we probably wouldn't know his name today if he had chosen that path. Rather, Guy Martin writes that Sankara was busy traveling to countries like Libya, countries hostile to the West and the old colonial powers that held his country in their grip. Sankara was courting on approved support and making friends where he was not supposed to. For he had long realized the ulterior motives of the Western world in Africa and was therefore suspicious of Europe and America. His invitation to Colonel Gaddafi to visit Upper Volta in 1983 seemed to have been the last straw for malevolent eyes watching on. Guy Martin, Ideology and Praxis, writes, Colonel Yorian Somme met the French president's special advisor on Africa, Guy Penn, who flew into Ouagadougou on 15th of May. But following this meeting in the French ambassador's residence, it was decided that Captain Sankara should be arrested along with other supporters. Indeed, Captain Sankara and most of his key supporters were rounded up. This would not be the first time the French would move around puppets on an African stage and it would not be the last time they would try to control Sankara's fate. But this time round, a higher power was looking out for Africa's man of the hour. Sankara's friend, Blaise Compaore, had escaped arrest. Somehow he managed to reach the garrison at Po, where Sankara had great support from his days there as commanding officer. 
Rallying the men in support for Sankara, Kompaore demanded Sankara's release, threatening to march on the capital otherwise. President Uedo Raogo, like a deer in the headlights, a fly caught in a web larger than he could comprehend, obliged. In the fighting that followed, Colonel Yorian Somme, with whose help the French had orchestrated Sankara's arrest, was killed. On the 4th of August 1983, Thomas Sankara became president of Upper Volta. The revolution of 1983 was like none other. First, it was led by an accidental revolutionary. So far as we know, Thomas Sankara wasn't seeking power. He wasn't a man looking to outmaneuver this or that political opponent or enrich himself and fill up the coffers of a secret Swiss bank account. Judging by his actions while he was in the political wings, he wanted only the best for his country. Ah, but now that he was president, he was going to laugh his way to the bank and rest his army boots firmly on the head of the upper Volton. No, not this time. See, Thomas Sankara has been painted by many as a communist. This is a nonsensical label which in the past has proven very useful for Europe and America, particularly when both sought to dethrone foreign leaders that took control of their country's resources to the detriment of Western corporate interests. The truth, like it often is, was in the grey areas. You can find it in Sankara's words, his actions, and in his country's historical context. First, his words, quote, The salvation of our peoples and our development require a total break with the worn-out models which all kind of quacks have tried to force on us during the last 20 years. End quote. Sankara clearly rejected the labels of Marxist, communist, even socialist. Quote, nowhere do we aim to build socialism in Burkina today. Close quote. He once said. Again, Quote, we are building a democratic modern society according to its economic content. Our revolution is a bourgeois revolution. It does not aim at the elimination of private property or private economic initiative and entrepreneurship. End quote. This last was untrue in the short term. Because for Sankara's government to deliver economically, it had to take back control of land and resources in a country systematically exploited by foreign private interests for decades. Thus, private land ownership was to be abolished to begin with. The result is documented by a, a P.D. Lawton on the website AfricanAgenda.net. He says, quote, Sankara transformed the world's poorest country at that time into a self-sufficient, modern-thinking nation." Close quote. And although he accepted some aid and small loans from foreign NGOs and even France, Sankara's economic operation was largely without the aid of Western countries. Marshalling his nation's manpower, he mandated civilians to take part in infrastructure building projects. After all, if Africans were to one day eat the fruits of an independent Africa, they would have to do the hard work in the present. And so Sankara's administration was responsible for a mass building and rehousing project aimed at eradicating slum dwellings. Brick factories purposely built to support such mass construction projects also stimulated the economy greatly. In just four years, there was no major region of Burkina Faso not connected by a network of roads and rail. Well ahead of his time, Sankara was a genuine environmentalist. Keen to halt the ever-spreading Sahara Desert, he started a project to plant a grove in every village. Tens of millions of trees were planted in under four years to combat desertification. And Sankara got his hands dirty with the rest of the country, personally planting hundreds of trees himself. Utilizing the agricultural experience he gained while working with farmer soldiers in Madagascar, Sankara put in place policies that saw his country's wheat production more than double from 1,700 kilograms of wheat per hectare to 3,900 kilograms per hectare in 1986. CanadianDimension.com claims that by nationalizing the majority of the country's resources, 
Sankara launched a series of commando operations to build a nation-spanning railroad to the tune of 100 kilometers of railway in just two years, increase literacy in the countryside and vaccinate children against measles, meningitis and yellow fever. All of this, the website says, was undertaken without accepting funds from international financial institutions. Quote, we don't want anything from anyone, said Sankara's foreign minister, Basil Guisu. No one will come to develop Burkina Faso in place of its own people. End quote. Burkina Faso. That was the name Thomas Sankara gave his country in 1984, a year on from the revolution. And today, 40 years on, the name remains. In the dialect of the Mori and the Duyula peoples, Burkina Faso means the land of the upright people. Sankara was on a mission to carve out a nation that was unlike any other. His revolution would reject the stereotypes of African revolutions. It would create a land without corruption, where public officials served the people, not the other way round. And in achieving this, Sankara did some unthinkable things. He sold off the government fleet of Mercedes cars and made the Renault 5 the official car. Sankara also didn't tell others to do things he wasn't prepared to do himself. According to David Smith, Africa correspondent for The Guardian, while he slashed the wages of his top officials, he led by example, paying himself a salary of $450 a month. He forbade the use of government chauffeurs and first-class airline tickets by government officials and civil servants and was staunchly opposed to foreign aid, saying, quote, he who feeds you controls you. And because he believed that very statement, Sankara began giving speeches calling on Africans to shun institutions like the World Bank and International Monetary Fund and stop taking on loans and economic help from the West. This was the beginning of the end for Sankara. When you go asking the question, who was responsible for Sankara's death and overthrow, invariably the answer that comes back from almost all corners is Blaise Compaori. This is a myth that pleases nobody as much as it does the innumerable intelligence agencies of France and America. Blaise Compaori, like Colonel Yorian Somme in 1983, was only a pawn, a very dangerous pawn at that. He was everything Sankara was not. Compaori had married for political gain, tying the knot with Chantal Terrasson de Fougere, an upper-class French Ivorian woman in 1985. This was seen by many as a marriage of political convenience that saw Compaori patronized with gifts direct from the treasury of the Ivorian government. His new wife was reputed to have a taste for a lavish lifestyle and didn't take to Sankara's dogma and austerity. According to Dr. Valéry Somme, a one-time minister of higher education and research, Chantal Compaori clashed with the president calling his efforts for Burkina Faso part of a quote, pretend revolution, during a dinner party after not being allowed by Sankara to serve him champagne. In building a greater Burkina Faso, Sankara knew no compromise. His failure was to dream too big. He expected that everyone around him was as passionate as he was for his people and for the cause. Not so. Source after source repeats the line that Compaori was not happy at the strictness of the regime. He believed good things should come to those who served in the highest offices, even at the expense of the people they were to be serving. On the outset of the revolution, Compaori probably thought Sankara would mellow over time and quit his talk of a better Africa, loosen up and open up that Swiss bank account in both their names. When Sankara proved to be a different type of man, a quietly, behind the scenes, Compaori turned. Now it was just a matter of time and opportunity for Compaori as to when to strike down his longtime friend. Meanwhile, Sankara pressed down harder on the accelerator. On 29 July 1987, 
at the summit of the Organization of African Unity held in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Thomas Sankara gave a speech titled, A United Front Against Debt. It is an injustice to paraphrase from it, so I won't do that. Instead, I quote Thomas Sankara's words directly. Quote, Those who lend us money are those who colonized us. They are the same ones who used to manage our states and economies. These are the colonizers who indebted Africa. We had no connections with this debt. Therefore, we cannot pay for it. We cannot repay because we don't have any means to do so. We cannot pay because we are not responsible for this debt. Close quote. Sankara went on, quote, Under its current form, controlled and dominated by imperialism, debt is a skillfully managed reconquest of Africa, intended to subjugate its growth and development through foreign rules. Thus, each one of us becomes the financial slave, which is to say, a true slave. Debt is neo-colonialism, in which colonizers have transformed themselves into technical assistants. We should rather say technical assassins. Each time an African country buys a weapon, it is against an African country. It is not against a European country. It is not against an Asian country. It is against an African country. I am a soldier and I carry a gun, but I would want us to disarm. Close quote. His audience clapped, laughed, and cheered, even when he said this. If Burkina Faso stands alone in refusing to pay, I will not be here for the next conference. In about three months from this speech, Thomas Sankara was executed in the manner described at the beginning of this video. In reading into the life and death of Thomas Sankara, one thing strikes the sympathetic reader. It's all very mesmerizing. His rise and fall is like a high-speed chase. It's like a scenario from an ancient scene. An evil sultan or lord has stolen a poor man's horse. His only means of making money, transportation and survival. And so he does what any man with red, hot blood coursing through his veins would do. He steals his horse back. But now he's on his horse, racing at breakneck speed away from the Lord and a hundred of his men on their own horses. It is a brilliant race to watch. The dust is spewing up in a million directions, the very earth is quaking and one man is tearing away from the devil and his greedy, hateful horde. You love to see it, the little man getting away with it for once, sticking one to the big man. But you know it can't last. You know sooner or later the lone rider will be caught and all the action in between will only be part of one great tragedy. And yet you will, you wish the little man to win. To somehow do the impossible and outrun the devil close behind. But it is not to be. What makes Sankara an even more remarkable man is that he himself knew it wasn't to be. He knew Kompare was plotting with international powers to oust him. Brian Peterson in his book, A Revolutionary in Cold War Africa, says that, quote, in the months before his death, Sankara's family and friends were inconsolable. Family members started coming by the house to ask what was going on between Blaze and Thomas. Pascal Sankara remembered. Uncle Hassan visited the home and screamed, They're going to kill him! But Thomas wouldn't do anything. Close quote. The perfect soldier, ruthless to the core, would have done something. He'd have found a way to kill Blaise Compaore before being killed. Instead, Sankara is reported by politician Germaine Petroipa as having said to her, quote, If I killed Blaise, then I would have to kill his brother and cousins, and it would never end. We can't take this path. Close quote. In the decades that followed Sankara's killing, Blaise Compaore cemented himself as the undisputed strongman of Burkina Faso and was welcomed into the international community with open arms. 
His role in Sankara's government was swept under the rug so long as he took the IMF's loans and opened Burkina Faso up to the vultures of Western big business. Gold and diamond mining firms from Canada, France and other countries have been invited to pick over the carcass of Burkina Faso. Today it remains among the world's poorest nations. Only recently, in 2014, was Compaore himself deposed. Trill Black is not about dwelling on the horrors and sins committed against the black diaspora. Black people are only one of many peoples at different times and places who have been hurt by other members of the human family. Atrocities are committed by all people on all people. Sankara himself understood this. In his 1987 speech at Addis Ababa, he pointed out that, quote, the popular masses of Europe are not opposed to the popular masses of Africa. Those who want to exploit Africa are those who exploit Europe too. We have a common enemy. This is true. What Trill Black is about is focusing on the positives, the neglected stories of black heroes and achievements. As P.D. Lawton says on AfricanAgenda.net, in the four years Sankara held power, he proved to the world what could be achieved in the blink of an eye by Africans under African leaders of integrity. There is a famous song by Bob Marley, and in it are the following words. How long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look? Well, we don't have to stand aside and look. We can stand and tell our children these stories of our prophets and their triumphs and by so doing keep the hope of a better tomorrow and a better us alive.